So we're ready to take your questions that you might have for Dr. Uh, Wainer. Um, I don't know that we have any updates on COVID and vascular anomalies, the same stuff, right? See their, yeah, yeah. See their doctor. Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions whether parents should send their kids to school who have um, are on medications like for Sturge Weber or serolimus. Well, you know, one of the one of the major issues is serolimus or serolimus is an immunosuppressant, and uh, you know, what do we do uh, with respect to COVID? And so the advice there is to continue with serolimus and only stop. Serolimus, if there is, uh, if there has been exposure and or symptomatology, so uh, most people are encouraged to continue with serolimus, unless, of course, there's some immune suppression or some other event. But typically, we advise people, and okay. there really hasn't been very much in the way of news. Uh, the literature keeps getting published, and uh, some interesting articles are coming out, but nothing new in terms of the management of vascular anomalies. And, and our study results, our study was done. It's, you know, we're waiting for the published results, but you will see something online in December when all the talks are on our website from this year's conference. Yep. So Roy Britton wants to know if we have a specialist in Dallas, Fort Worth area. Um, yet, um, not to my knowledge, I don't know if you know anyone in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Well, there's Jay Burns. Jay is a very well-known plastic surgeon, and uh, Jay did a fellowship with John Mulliken, so he knows That's all right. about vascular anomalies. He's in Dallas? Yeah. Okay. So, so Jay is a plastic surgeon. That should be on our website, Roy. If it's not, we'll get that information for you. Uh, Rishma says, I have a two-year-old with a lip hemangioma, has never been treated, not big, but wondering if it will disappear given the location, the lip. Okay, one of the problems with lip hemangiomas is that, and, and this obviously depends on the size of the hemangioma, uh, you get very small hemangiomas, medium-sized and very large, and one of the problems with hemangiomas that are large is that they can stretch the lip and in stretching the lip, the muscle of the lower lip especially uh, becomes very elongated and it becomes very difficult for the child to close his or her mouth. So any hemangioma on the lip deserves more attention and especially lesions that distort the architecture of the lip would require more active intervention. And we're mu much more inclined to actually do surgery on lip hemangiomas. Now, obviously, if there's a very small hemangioma, then um, we clearly don't need to do much about it. Uh, there's always laser treatment, topical timolol or propranolol, but don't forget surgery because surgery is a uh, viable. Okay, so Ann Antonelli, hi, Ann. She wants to know, is there an increased risk for those with Sturge Weber or Port Weinstein in the workplace? Increased risk uh, of, COVID, uh, because of COVID? No, not necessarily. Um, you know, COVID uh, gets to all of us, but there's no increased risk in patients with vascular anomalies, not to the best of my knowledge. Okay, Andrea asks, her seven-year-old has a venous malformation, a venous, a lymphovenous malformation on her arm, hand, and chest. It's been over two years since her last MRI, which also showed bone loss. Is there anything I should request her vascular anomaly team look for regarding this on her next MRI? I recently heard of Gorm Stout and worry about any other bone loss, which were not previously on our radar. We are in Ottawa, Canada. Okay, so bone loss is very often progressive, and uh, under those circumstances, it is important to follow up. It is important to do uh, successive scans to determine whether or not there's been any additional bone loss. And one of the things we are very keen on doing is that we will treat children with bone loss uh, with serolimus or any of the other medications to try and prevent progressive bone loss. So what I would say is yes, it is important to get a repeat scan 
to see if the bone loss has actually gotten any worse and under such circumstances uh, it, it's important to actually go ahead and get treatment and okay. medical treatment is what uh, we recommend for those patients. Um, I think this might be, Chelsea might be um, the one, the picture I showed you. She said her little boy fell and split his hemangioma open. Mm -hmm. And we've tried everything for pranolol, timolol. Would you suggest them to just remove it? And what yeah. are the risks with surgery? Yeah, so um, Linda actually showed me a photograph of mm -hmm. a child who bumped his head and, and um, unfortunately injured himself in the right in the line of the hemangioma. So under those circumstances, I would seriously consider just removing the hemangioma. You've got an incision, the incision goes straight through the hemangioma. It doesn't seem to make any sense to leave the hemangioma, just simply removing it, and uh, this would enable you to get a nice clean uh, suture line and a nice clean scar, whereas just gluing it or doing something like that um, I would disagree with. So I would think that this is a great opportunity and an excuse to actually get treatment for the hemangioma. I think that's a great answer. Um, Will Cor wants to know, I don't know if you can answer this, but how many laser treatments do you need to have before you start serolimus? I think, is that, I, I'm not sure what you mean, Will Cor. Are you saying for a port wine stain? Because there's some places where they do use like a topical like rapamycin or yeah. rapamine but yeah so that's, that's been undecided right whether yeah so that was something that Stuart uh, came up with was the use of uh, topical serolimus or uh, and in, in conjunction with laser treatments but I'm not sure that you need to have several laser treatments before starting uh, rapamycin or vice versa. The two are not mutually exclusive. You can do both of them at the same time. You can do one before the other or the other before the one. It doesn't really make much difference. Uh, frequently we do both together. So we'll do some laser treatments and between laser treatments we'll treat with a topical agent. Um, some people will have them on an oral agent like serolimus throughout this process but yeah, it really doesn't make much uh, much difference. Okay, um, so Corinne's forwarding a question from a mom. She just mess messaged us trying to get to this. Her 10-month-old with a hemangioma on the elbow has a lump under her skin near her spine. Her pediatrician and her neurologist suggest she sees a, plas a pediatric derm before an MRI. Do you think this is a hemangioma under the skin? They live in New Jersey. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's impossible for me to say without actually seeing the child. Um, typically, if there's a hemangioma somewhere on the body and another lump or mass presents, uh, one's inclined to think that that too is a hemangioma. Uh, this is sometimes a mistake, and the lesion needs to be examined and taken by its merits or on its merits. It may be another hemangioma, it may not. We don't know for sure, and certainly the evidence that's being presented to me would not uh, help me determine whether it is or it isn't. So you need to take this on its merits. If it looks like a hemangioma, well then it probably is one, but if it doesn't, then it needs to be investigated. And just because there's a hemangioma somewhere in the body doesn't necessarily mean that this particular one is a hemangioma. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Jennifer from Australia. Hi um, to a mum from Australia. She has a 4.5 year old boy with a 5.3 centimeter non-involuting congenital hemangioma on his torso. Um, all the docs say there's no treatment. Do you have any more information? So how, how old is the child again? He's four and a half. There are so many veins going into it visible she could just email that, right? Yeah, you so you could email me a photo of this, but um, at this stage, I would say that um, I would entertain surgery. I mean, especially surgery. if it is a niche, a non-involuting, yeah. it's not going to go anywhere. Correct. 
So under those yeah. circumstances, I really think very seriously about surgery. And you can email him at birthmark.org backslash wainer. That's birthmark.org backslash wainer. Um, okay, so we have a lot more. Hi, Michelle Lai, to, Hi, to you. Michelle. <laughs> um, uh, bon jo, jo Tay is saying, Hi, Dr. Wainer and Dr. Linda. Chelsea Lamont, my little boy fell and split his hemangioma open last week. Oh, no, we already had that one. Um, it must have been a repeat. Mm -hmm. uh, Kate Ann, my son has a different type of birthmark. At first, we thought it was a niche. He was born with it. Ultrasound shows it's vascular, but our pediatric dermatologist isn't sure it's a hemangioma. She said it might be fibrous. My question would be, would you recommend a biopsy? He's only four months old. Yeah, you definitely want to know what it is. Um, are they concerned that it may be some sort of uh, tumor, or do they definitely believe it's a birthmark? If it's a benign condition, you can wait and see. Um, perhaps show this to one or two other doctors and get other opinions but if you're concerned that this is some kind of tumor then obviously a biopsy would be appropriate we only we don't typically do biopsies we would only do biopsies if uh, we were concerned about whether we were dealing with some kind of tumor but under most circumstances we don't uh, we can do clinical examination we can do ultrasound. Sometimes we would do an MRI, but biopsies usually are somewhere far down the list. And again, if you want to shoot them a picture, yeah, um, it's uh, birthmark.org backslash Wainer. Um, so Phil Gorf is saying he's had both of his lips reduced with surgery. I don't know if he just wanted to tell us that. There's no question. I don't know if he was mm -hmm. one of your patients, but. Um, it's not uncommon, bilateral port wine on the upper and lower lip. We've seen sure. a lot of those, and sometimes you do have to do both. So, incidentally, port wine stains are commonly associated with tissue overgrowth. Um, in the early days, when I first began to see these patients, I called it soft tissue hypertrophy. Soft meaning all the tissues except bone but we subsequently found out that bone was commonly involved. And so it is segmental hypertrophy. It's not soft tissue, it's the entire segment. And you know, embryologically, a child develops in segments. Each segment develops independently and interdependently. And so if uh, there is a genetic abnormality in one segment, then the entire segment uh, would manifest with such an abnormality and that would include the bone. So it's soft tissue and bony hypertrophy. Um, question two. So there's been some discussion that those enlarged lips aren't really a port wine at all. They may be a venous malformation. No, is that not true? at all. No, no not at so all. It is, it's just a port wine with tissue hypertrophy. Correct, yeah. In fact, we've studied this extensively with Marty Mim and Ignacio, and we looked at pathology of lip overgrowth, and it seems to be just simply overgrowth of all the layers of tissue, bone, muscle, soft tissue, etc. And it is not um, anything else. It's not vascular. The surface may be involved with a vascular malformation, but it is not. Okay, that's, thank you for that clarification because it was brought up at yeah. one of the past live sessions whether they were actually a venous malformation. No, no. But that would be a capillary. There are capillary venous. So an, a patient that can confirm how long you've been doing laser, <laughs> Chuck Alderson said you did laser on him from 91 to 96 wow. in Little Rock, <laughs> Arkansas. Boy. So that's, that's, that's almost 30 years ago. Next year, yeah, that's yeah. 30 years. Yeah, We're yeah. dating ourselves, right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, so hello, Chuck, and thank you for writing in and telling us that. Um, Lorden said again, is it advisable to give some medicine, perhaps aspirin to children, preventively when there's a risk of Sturge Weber, especially during the first two years of life? You know, um, 
I mean, this is spoken about the use of yeah, aspirin. Dr. Dr. Yeah. Comey talks about that yeah. prophylactic. Yeah, right? and uh, you know, I'm not. There is no firm evidence that it actually does anything. There is no firm evidence that it's beneficial. That doesn't mean that it's not beneficial. All it means is that there has been no um, accepted trial which has looked at the use of aspirin in these children that I'm aware of. I'm not aware of any clinical trial that's been done. So all we can say is that at this stage we don't know there is no evidence that it is beneficial, but that doesn't mean that it isn't beneficial. If you can understand that, it's a there's a double uh, intent, a double meaning there. But that's um, so. Chelsea Lamont, the one who's talked about her little boy falling, that is the one that I showed you the picture of. Yeah. And this is really an important point because she said that. Um, it's not glued because it can't be, well, she said uh, it's currently glued, but it can't be glued forever. And I talked to you about this, and you've said this to me about the scar will be worse unless they do go in and, and correct this properly, right? Yeah, because I mean, there's... A scar from gluing is going to be a heck of a lot worse than if you go in and remove the hemangioma. Yeah, obviously it would be advantageous to remove it because you have an excellent opportunity to do a primary closure. In other words, the surgeon can go in, remove the hemangioma, and close the wound with all sorts of sutures and get an exceptionally good result, uh, as opposed to just simply gluing it. But that doesn't mean that glue is bad for it. Um, I'm sure that the doctor used glue because it was a convenient thing to use, and uh, it will keep the edges opposed and it will heal. But obviously, um, in my opinion, going in and removing the hemangioma seems to be the way to go. Certainly that's what I would have done. But we have to accept that uh, different doctors have different opinions, and this is simply my opinion. This is not something that's cast in stone. Um, okay, so we're getting a lot of questions in here. Some are showing up on my phone and some on here. So Shannon Shea said her son had a hemangioma behind his eye as a baby. He was given an interferon A. That's mm -hmm. a long time ago. Yeah. 22, yeah. Um, they have never rechecked. He's 22, should I worry? My other children have all had some vascular problem, AVM of the brain, etc. Do you know much about VEDS, V-E-D-S? Okay, so, uh, you know, the question is, was this really a hemangioma behind the eye, or was it a vascular malformation? And uh, did it respond to interferon? Interferon was used extensively about 20 years ago. 25. Yeah. Before, yeah. before we were really, they were using it when, we came, when I came on the scene with you. Correct. Yeah. And so it was used extensively to treat children with both hemangiomas and vascular malformations. And this was before the time when the classification was fully accepted. And so people called anything with blood vessels hemangiomas and treated it. Now, um, something behind the eye is probably not a hemangioma, most likely to be a vascular malformation. And, uh, you know, did it respond to interferon or did it not respond? So to answer that question, I think you'd have to uh, determine how your child has done. I would definitely take your child to see somebody. He's not a child anymore, but take your, your well, still your child, but take your child to see somebody and determine whether a, a repeat MRI is necessary. And this should be based on the clinical symptoms and the clinical scenario. Now, she mentioned the other kids, too, and one with a brain AVM. What about a pic 3 ca mutation? That's like uh, maybe she should have be tested. Yeah, so if there is a high preponderance of other vascular lesions in the family, it's not a bad idea to get some genetic testing, and uh, pic c 3 a is a, a gene abnormality as a possibility. Um, so Bobby says her, her son's 23. He was diagnosed as a baby with KTS um, on his knee. He has a large growth that bleeds. 
They tried cauterizing, but it didn't last long. It seems no one in Charlotte has any experience. I reached out to Dr. Linda's center pit and she mentioned it looked like a huge angiokeratoma. She gave me two resources to reach out, but haven't had any luck with them getting back. He was hospitalized last week, low blood count. Mm. So maybe so clearly, or Well, no, either that or there's been significant chronic hemorrhage, which would have caused a low blood count. But, you know, this clearly is an indication to treat, um, either so surgically or otherwise. Yeah, she I wants to send the pictures to you, which yeah, of course sure. she can. Yeah. She could also possibly reach out to Hockman. Because he's got yeah. a good team. Dr. Hockman has a really good team in um, South Carolina. In South Carolina. Sure. I may have gave her one of his yeah. name, and maybe he didn't get back to her because I remember giving her the, the direct emails. But um, again, send it to Dr. Wayner at birthmark.org backslash Wayner. Also copy me, bbfpresident at gmail.com on it, and remind me who I gave you that didn't respond to you because I think it's really important that we know they, they do need to respond to you about these. Um, uh, Chelsea said, if a hemangioma does involute, is there any concern for internal involvement after in involution in the future? Not necessarily. Um, you know, if there was no internal involvement, uh, there isn't going to be. We only suspect internal involvement if there are multiple hemangiomas. And in this instance, there would need to be five or six or more skin hemangiomas, and then we start looking for internal hemangiomas. Now, um, it doesn't mean that if somebody has a small hemangioma, there isn't one on the liver or spleen, but it's not likely to cause any problems. So we only begin to search if there are multiple hemangiomas. And the number is five or six. And the question that she and I had been talking about, because she clearly has a port wine stain on her upper lip that's been treated. She's an adult. But I saw pictures of her yesterday. She sent them to me on her neck and shoulder. She had some hemangiomas that have involuted. And that side is where she has, like, chronic ear problems. And I hear from a lot of patients with children with port wine stains about chronic ear problems. Is that something we've ever looked at? Is that something that could be related? or? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not aware of any relationship. Uh, I don't know any relationship between chronic ear problems. Okay, I know. Yeah. Uh, so Sanja said her son has a hemangioma in his left armpit. His doctor said it would go away by 10. Well, you know, that's the uh, information that used to be given. Um, the common information or the common message was that 50% would disappear by five years of age, 60% by six, etc., etc. Unfortunately, hemangiomas are not that simple and they don't necessarily obey these very nice rules. So we know that hemangiomas involute, and we know that by three and a half to four and a half, most of the involution is done. After that stage, there's very little involution that goes on further than four and a half years of age. So from four and a half to 10, yes, maybe another 10 or 15%, but most of it is done by four and a half, according to uh, most reliable studies. Now, he's two and a half years old, and yeah. I mean, I'd like to see a picture of that too. True. The other thing is that's constantly in contact with clothing and is gonna be it probably could be prone to bleeding, right, if it's constantly... Yeah, that's, uh, that's a possibility, but, you know, um, yeah, I was going to say something else. By two and a half, um, most of hemangiomas that are going to do exceptionally well usually are early involutors. In other words, they start the process of involution early. Typically, by the time the child is a year or a year and a half, of age, uh, the, it's obvious that this hemangioma is involuting quite rapidly. Whereas if you look at the hemangioma at a year, and you look at it again at one and a half years, and there really isn't much change, then that's a slow involuter, and the slow involuters are less likely to complete this process. So, you know, the literature said that all hemangiomas would be gone by 
10 to 12 years of age, that simply isn't true. The literature shows and research has shown that only 50% of hemangiomas will completely involute by um, 10 to 12 years of age. Only 50%. So that's a far cry from 100%. And, and like I said, I'd like to see a picture of it, especially because depending on where it is in the armpit, it's always got pressure on it. It should be dusky. It should be like sure. showing signs of involution. Send, send a photo yeah. and we'll definitely yeah. take a look at um, it. Anna Kakruzzi said, is there any chance that a venous malformation will disappear completely? Is it possible to disappear without treating? Okay, venous malformations don't disappear. In fact, they do the opposite. They are vascular malformations, and as the child gets older, the malformation increases in size, and so they will not disappear. Uh, vascular malformations don't disappear. Only hemangiomas do that, and so there's a distinct difference. And as I said, vascular malformations increase in size as the child gets older. Okay, um, so Tiffany says hi to us that her daughter is eight months old with a bearded segmental hemangioma, has been on propranolol, all three milligrams per kilo a day since three weeks of age. What are the benefits versus the risk of starting laser treatments, um, waiting for or waiting for more natural involution? How old is the child again? She is, she's been on it eight months. Eight months. So one of the problems with segmental hemangiomas is ulceration. The risk of ulceration is much, much higher with segmental hemangiomas. And uh, we believe that laser treatment can cause ulceration. And so we typically prefer to wait until the hemangioma starts involuting. Um, I don't like to do laser treatment before the child's a year to 18 months of age. Every now and again I will, but I will always do a test patch before. So laser treatment too early on can cause problems, and one of the problems is ulceration, which can lead to extensive scarring. So you really have to be very careful. Um, one of your former patients, Ava, I think maybe she still is, Ava Piles, um, she has some residuum hemangioma on the eyebrow. I was wondering if there's anything that can be done for that. Um, treatment, definitely treatment. But, you know, the problem with the eyebrow is that you have hairs on the eyebrow, and if your treatment is too aggressive, you can lose the hairs, and uh, you, know, you have to weigh up the pros and cons. Um, you know, is it important to keep the brow? So what we typically do is try and preserve the brow and do what we can to make it look very, very normal. But extensive laser treatment in the brow can cause hair loss, and that hair loss can be permanent, and uh, that's always a problem. So losing the brow is something that we have to be very careful about. Thank you. So we're halfway through our hour session. Lots of good questions. Michelle Lai, another familiar name. Yeah, so hi, she's Michelle. been on the computer a lot, and her vision in her right eye is getting worse. She said she feels pressure when she's on the screen. You know, she said her other eye is fine, so she was wondering if the AVM could be a cause of this. Yeah, definitely. So um, if you have a hemifacial vascular anomaly, in other words, if a uh, large part of your face is involved. Because of the vascular malformation, especially uh, arteriovenous malformation, the blood vessels are very dilated. The veins are large and the arteries are large because there's more blood circulating through that area. And under those circumstances, it's not unusual to see symptoms as a consequence of this and pressure in the eye would be just such a symptom. So it's related to the fact that you have a vascular malformation on one side of your face and there, are, there is an increase in blood vessels and much more circulation going through these blood vessels. And so that in turn can cause pressure headaches and pain behind the eye. And it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a vascular malformation behind the eye it's secondary to the blood vessels. What, what can she do? 
Uh, there's really not a hell of a lot you can do. I think one of the things we can do is we can do an MRI or an MRA or an MRV and look at the circulation and determine if there is anything. A good interventional radiologist might slow blood vessels down or might reduce the number of blood vessels there if there's a tremendous amount of symptoms. But we'd have to look at the vasculature and, and decide from there. Maybe she could get that done and bring it in December. Sure. yeah. Um, so Ann Clymer Zeller, I'm not sure what she's talking about, but I think I know. She's saying, is there anything you can do to stop the puffing of skin? I'm 50 and it's raising. I think she might be talking about a port wine and tissue hypertrophy. Possibly, so yeah. So is yeah. there anything? No. You know, this is the natural history. Uh, with vascular malformations, as you get older, there is uh, increased circulation. There is thickening of all the layers of tissue. And uh, this can result in certain symptoms. So thickening of the skin that you're talking about may be related to this. Well, and also related to their birthmark, Chuck, the patient that yeah. you know had the laser 30 years ago. See, he obviously has not been diagnosed with Sturge Weber, but he's saying he has glaucoma and seizures. Could this be related? Oh well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So he needs to see a neurologist that understands Sturge Weber. No, or. Uh, vascular anomalies team. Right. Yeah. And that actually, Dr. Richter's there in Little Rock, if he's still there. Oh, Grisham, yeah. Greg Grisham Richter, yeah, right? Very he, much he, so, And yeah. Dr. Son, is he he's still there? Too as well? Correct, yeah. yeah. But Grisham Richter is, has a very uh, strong vascular anomalies program. Um, so Shannon was saying that that lesion that was behind her son's eye shrunk but his eye seems to be sinking down in it. So again, she should probably uh, get You know what that sounds like? That sounds like a venous malformation because as the child gets older, the, um, the pressure in the venous malformation diminishes and sometimes we see what's called anophthalmus. The eye starts to sink back into the orbit. And that's fairly common. And, with I, and I think that's the kid that was on the alpha interferon. Correct, yeah. So I would definitely see somebody, perhaps get an MRI and see exactly what's going on. Especially now that there is or there are symptoms and something is happening. Um, so Nicole Mills Millis says her son has a port wine on the left side of his face. He was born in 2011 and after 17 days started his first laser. He has great clearance till his third birthday and then we maintain it by doing treatments once a year. Mm -hmm. to, to he's, two years he didn't have anything and the Port Ryan returned after two years not doing that one maintenance treatment. Correct. Uh, so the last treatment didn't show any signs of improvement. He's even worse. He will see Dr. Tom Brees on laser day on the 10th. There you go. So that's mm -hmm. one of the ones. Mm -hmm. In case we don't have the uh, settings of the previous treat treatments will be easy for you. Yes. So, so you'll, be, you'll, you'll be treating that child. Yes. So I'll see you on the 10th. But, uh, you know, this is something that's very interesting. When I began to do research on uh, port wine stains, I remember I put one of my residents to work and we began to review all the patients who would had treatment over a period of five years. And we, what I had seen clinically was that if you didn't treat a port wine stain for a long period of time, it began to get darker. And so we wanted to look at this and see whether in fact that was true. And lo and behold, the research found just that. We found that if you stop treating a port wine stain, as the years would go by, it would begin to darken. So the concept of maintenance treatment came into being because what do you do to prevent it from darkening? Well, you don't have to keep treating at such a high intensity rate. What one can do is just simply do maintenance treatments. But if you stop doing maintenance and it is a growing port wine stain, it will come back. And that's a really important case, so I'd like, if she yeah. could email me at vbfpresident at gmail.com, I'd like to see the pictures of birth, when you got maximum clearance, and then in that time period, how much came back. 
Because we keep saying that maintenance is important. Yeah, maintenance treatment. Now, well, maybe one or two treatments is not sufficient because now yeah. the port wine stain is different from what it was when the child was younger. The growth period that the child is in maybe is, is very, very different, especially around puberty. So you may require more than one treatment to get back to where you were yeah. and uh, it may require several treatments. Good point. Diana Carroll said she has la had laser in Dallas, yeah. traveling every five to six weeks from Reynosa, Mexico, a border city with the USA. It was when I was 12 to 14. Now I'm 41. I still have my port wine. It got lighter. I couldn't continue because of time in school, but I wanted to go back a year ago to see the doctor. The only thing really bothers me is two dots, like pimples that appeared in the area, is this something that happens with age? Yeah. So this definitely is something that happens with age. Those two dots are called cobblestones and what you're seeing is early cobblestones and you know if you're 40, 41 years of age this is about the age that cobblestones commonly appear and these cobblestones will grow and grow if you leave them alone and don't do anything about them they definitely will grow and cause problems. So I would encourage you to seek treatment. It's possible to treat the cobblestones and stop them from progressing. But without treatment, they definitely will progress. Thank you. Um, this may be a patient of yours, Maria Holacheva from Bulgaria. She said she is fine. Thank you. That may, might be one of, yes, your, yeah. one of your patients. And she might be saying her child's fine, so thank you. Sure. Um, uh, Carrie Printelos, her four-year-old son has a lymphatic malformation in his head and neck. Within the last few months, we discovered another cyst below his thyroid. He also has had another rare lesion on his side. Have you experienced other patients with different types of cyst lesions? Is this common for VM patients to be more prone to have other types of lesions? No, I'm not aware of that. Um, Me neither. No, I, no. I tend to think it's related. Yeah, it may be, but we don't know any relationship, so it may be related. It may be that uh, medical science hasn't uh, figured out what the exact link is, but I'm not aware of any relationship or any known link. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, so Larna Rodriguez, nice to see Dr. Wainer still helping people. My son Josiah was treated for a lymphatic malformation by Dr. Weiner at Arkansas Children's yeah. and a few times in New York. He's 21 now and a senior at Stanford. He is opting for no further treatment right now. That's a good That's report. That's great. Thank yeah. you and thanks for, thanks for coming in and saying hi. It's always good to hear from yes. old patients, especially I did have a previous life. Mm -hmm. I worked in Arkansas for a long period and uh, developed my career there. In fact, I started doing vascular anomalies in Arkansas at Children's Hospital and worked there for a long period of time. And that's where we met. Correct. We did yeah. Christine's surgery 25 years ago. We just celebrated our 25th anniversary this <laughs> August when you did Christine's. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't exactly well, call it yeah, my it anniversary. Yeah, it was our anniversary, and I told you you owe me a silver gift for 25 years because... <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Barbara, another one from um, I know. I, oh yeah, another one from Arkansas. Uh, Barbara Desern Durham, her daughter Amanda has CM AVM with RASA one. You and Dr. James Son diagnosed her in Little Rock in '98. We're just wondering if there are any good doctors in North Carolina. Yeah, in not in North Carolina. That I don't really know anyone in North Carolina, but. Definitely in South Carolina, in Charleston, Marcelo Hockman's there, and he's an exceptionally talented, gifted surgeon. And if you write to me, I can give you his email. So Sure. Um, so Imad said last month my son had his surgery on his leg, but still the tumor is on his leg. I don't think they removed it. We, you'd yeah. have to send Dr. Wayner pictures yes, so for us to know. Yes, yeah, so clearly if it's still there, early on so one of the one of the important things is that if you remove a vascular malformation and it reappears very early 
this is an indication that the um, that much of it was left behind and so early regrowth is a sign that uh, the surgery was not complete and that they were not able to or not uh, in, did not intend to remove the entire lesion okay um jennifer cox said hi hi guys i'm a 34 year old who has had a birthmark over about 45, 40% of the right side of my face. Yeah. I've had about 17 laser treatments from the age of 2 to 27. I'm wondering, has there been any new information linking the HIFU, all therapy treatments to help decrease the size of it? I've heard about that old therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if the blood pattern could be changed depending on where the energy is placed. I pre previously noticed some results with microneedling. I'm an LE who's been practicing about six years. Yeah, you know, I'm not aware of, of any, any useful information. Um, you know, I can only give you information that's been published, and I'm not aware of any information that's been published in that regard. So okay. I'm sorry, I can't really... Evelyn um, Yap Chim Peng said she's 20 years, 20 years ago I gave birth to my eldest daughter who was diagnosed with Casabac Mera syndrome. Through God's lead, I found Dr. Weiner from Google. I had asked him for advice to help my daughter as the hospital she was in had little knowledge on how to treat. Doctors were not familiar with this disease. Thank God Dr. Weiner had responded to my request and had a good communication with my doctor to help to treat my daughter. She's 20 years old now, is doing fine and living in Melbourne. We were from Malaysia before. I have to thank you very much, Dr. Wayne. With that, your small gesture, I might not be seeing my daughter till now. Thank you very, very much. Very important it's stuff. Very, very kind to remember that. Yep. Thank you. Carlos Perez per per yeah. says hi. Hi, Carlos. And Emily. It's been, a, uh, it's been a long time, Carlos. You need to come back to New York and say hello. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Emily Moeller is saying, two yes. of the most impactful people in my life, thank you for all you've done for me. You, hi, you're Emily. welcome from both of us. Excellent. Thank you. Ani um, says her daughter has a vascular malformation on the sclera of her eye that does not grow visually, is there any likelihood that it will grow deeper and not appear visually? No. Scleral lesions usually stay on the sclera, which is superficial. It's right. <clears throat> These lesions don't typically grow into the eye, and so it just remains a lesion on the sclera, and it can be taken care of. Uh, Dr. Fay has done multiple surgeries for children like this, and we can take care of these. But they do not grow into the eye, and they do not affect eyesight. Okay, so Diana Carroll said she has, um, oh, I'm sorry, Jennifer Cox said sun, about sun exposure, does it increase the thickening of a port wine stain? No. As aging occurs? No, in fact, I'm not aware of sun exposure. Sun exposure. Yeah, well, having any effect on vascular malformations. Well, Dr. Um, Nelson says that the, um, sun isn't good for port wine stains. Possibly, but, you know, once again, if we look at the literature and what's been published, nothing really has been published on that, so that would be anecdotal yes. information, which may be correct, we because could, yeah, we could Dr. Do a study on that. Stewart lives in California, and there's a lot more sun than there is here. Um, Diana, again, with another question, she said she, had, she was responding saying she also has problems with her ear not chronic but um according to the doctor the ear canals are are, are she may be saying closed up another mm -hmm. issue is that my jaw is a millimeter different from the port wine stain side and it seems that i tend to clench it due to stress the way i accommodate the bite then i have some headaches and ear pain i use braces to correct my smile so i think she's saying she has an asymmetry problem probably yeah. from the what you said, the bone overgrowth from the port correct. wine? Yeah, and in fact, uh, that's correct. The uh, bony overgrowth would cause asymmetry, and so the bite would be off. And some people, especially if the bite is off by a, a very small amount, people would try and compensate for that and not get treatment. And uh, this may result in headaches of the temporal type etc. So, yeah, this is known. Um, 
So Ann Kleinman Zeller said she's looking for a doctor to treat her port wine in Wisconsin. I mean, I know Dr. Linda Rabinowitz yeah, is in a, she's a dermatologist in Wisconsin that treats these. She's at um, Children's Hospital, isn't she? She was at the Children's Hospital, but I yeah. think she's in private practice now. Yeah. Linda Rabinowitz is Dr. Uh, Linda Rabinowitz. Yeah. Um, if she's not on our website, you can um, just Google her name and find her where her practice is. Yeah. So Jill um, McAleenan said her daughter is 17 weeks old. Congratulations. She has a hemangioma on her scalp and one on her belly. She started Timolol at five weeks and laser at seven. She does laser every other week. Well, that's a lot. The doc says she's in the rapid growth phase. Mm -hmm. Is this the correct treatment or should we be doing more? The doctor didn't recommend propranolol because of side effects, but wondering if we should look into something else. Well, you know, it depends on whether the timolol is actually doing anything. In fact, I mean, whatever you've said sounds correct. But once again, if the hemangioma is very thick, then superficial timolol will only affect the surface of the hemangioma and not the deep portion. So it depends on the hemangiomas. If they very, very thin, superficial hemangiomas, this is fine. But if they're very thick hemangiomas, then under those circumstances, propranolol would be more beneficial. And incidentally, you know, there aren't really... The side effect profile of propranolol has been pretty good. You know, there are some side effects, but uh, if a patient needs propranolol, they should get it. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be frightened away by side effects if your child definitely needs it. And I think, too, like with that aggressive lasering every two weeks and the topical together, if, it should be if it's resolving it, then that's yeah. a great protocol to sure. avoid surgery or any ulceration or anything. But yeah, it, it does sound like a good uh, program that you're on. Um, Ahmed Gafour said, hi, I've, now he's saying he has a hemangioma, uh, obviously he doesn't, on his right arm. I had surgery three years ago, but now the tumor has grown up again. The results, the freeze in movement of all my arm. We need your assistance, please. So go ahead and send a photograph of your lesion and as much information as you have, ultrasounds, MRIs, etc. Mm -hmm. If you've lost movement, it clearly means that uh, there has been some muscle involvement. And so we would need to see the MRIs to be able to see exactly what's going on. Kristen saying hi, Kristen Wall. So we're just talking about you, saying, you know, hopefully everything's all doing well. Um, you're glad, oh, sorry, <laughs> glad you keep in touch with Dr. Weiner. Um, hi from Morocco. Oh. Uh, yeah. you know, she wants to talk to Dr. Weiner. So uh, the first, you can send your question here or to Dr. Weiner at birthmark.org backslash Weiner. Yeah, you can email me yeah. and I will respond. I do actually have several patients from Morocco, so. Yep, yeah. I remember the little girl. Yeah. Tiffany Hillier, regarding laser treatment with a bearded segmental hemangioma, your recommendation was 12 to 18 months. Under what circumstances would you recommend doing every laser therapy before one year, even with the risk of additional ulceration? You know, I'm very nervous about laser treatment early on. <clears throat> We've seen very difficult situations. We've seen some very bad side effects. And so if we approach laser treatment, we only, early on, we only do so if it's absolutely necessary and uh, under a very controlled situation. Uh, in the presence of ulceration and a still growing segmental hemangioma, I am very nervous about starting laser treatment too early. So we yeah. will wait, I think we should wait until at least 12 months of age. So um, Amand asked for your email and we did um, tell him, so Amand, it's birthmark.org backslash Wainer, W-A-N-E-R. And I'm sure somebody will post it in the string here so you can see it again. And you can directly email Dr. Weiner. Um, the conference is still on December 12th, Lord willing, that we'll, we're holding our own right now. So sure. hopefully 
Um, if you haven't registered, please register at birthmark.org backslash conferences. Um, and you'll see the application there. Talfer Talibi is from Morocco. My daughter is visiting a professor in Germany, but I have the problems here and I need to continue with you, please. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, once again, contact me directly. You can contact me through VBI and I will respond. She, if she could make it to Greece next month, you could do a clinic sure, evaluation. Sure. So we will be in Athens. Uh, we have a conference, um, sort of a clinic. mini a clinic coming up in Ath Athens, and I will be seeing some patients and doing some treatments. So if anybody is close by and would like to see me in Athens, um, I will be available. So again, you can email Dr. Wainer at birthmark.org backslash Wainer, or you can email me, vbfpresident at gmail.com. I can get you that information of who to call or email in um, in Athens to see Dr. Weiner. Quick question, is there any alternative to stop tongue bleeding after our bleomycin sessions? They helped a lot, but some of the bleeding came back. That's from Carlos. Yeah, unfortunately, we've you know, got to be a little more aggressive with treatment. Um, there's nothing new, Carlos, other than more laser, more bleomycin. We should be able to get things under control that way. Hi, Jim. Jim's one of my new uh, compatriots in the UK. Him and I are working to bring more um, access to the UK for laser. So he's, um, yeah, his question is, this has been informative in the short space of time I've been in. Excellent question and answers on Port Wine. I totally missed the notification for the webinar. Is it recorded? Yes. It is recorded. All of them are recorded, Jim. We go back to January of 2017, and you can see many of them and all that you want. And thank you for your blessings. Shannon uh, says, I'm 48 with port wine on the left cheek, nose, temple, and ear. I woke completely deaf last winter. Can it be attributed to the port wine? Yes, so there is some relationship between vascular malformations and sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, this has been published, and there are one or two papers that have noted this. So there is a relationship between head and neck vascular malformations and hearing loss. Okay, uh -huh. the actual cause we don't know, uh, whether it's genetic or whether there is some physiological abnormality, but it definitely has been reported. Thank you, so we have five minutes left and we have some good questions here. Dimitro said he's from the Ukraine. Have you um, heard if it's gonna appear better, oh, is there gonna be a better laser than the Prima? You know, every few years a better laser comes out, and uh, whether or not it actually is better or not uh, remains to be seen. When the Prima came out, you know, you know that the Prima is a combined neodymium YAG and uh, pulse dye laser. There were some problems initially with it, which I understand have been ironed out, and I have no doubt that a new and better laser will come out, but most important thing to do is to determine whether in fact it is actually better or not before using it in treatment. So the answer to that question is yes, there will be a new laser at some point and whether or not it will be better remains to be seen. And again, a question about the conference. We are still planning uh, December. Uh, 12th at Dr. Geronimus's office. Dr. Weiner will be there. We will have 12, I mean six, six clinic teams with 12 medical experts, um, laser, dental exams, and psychotherapy sessions. Um, Dr. Khalil um, wants to know, uh, for a glomangioma, would you use rapamycin? Yeah, glomangioma or gloma venous, venous malformation, yes, I would. I would consider using rapamycin. Okay. So, so it's like we're running to no, the No, no. Um, have you heard, have you heard, oh, okay, yes, yeah, so that is right, we are. So right to the end, we're running to the end. So we're at 57 minutes, and if we, I don't see any more questions, we're cart right, I don't think I missed any. Um, if I did miss any, please email Dr. Wayner directly. You can see right there, you can click right on 
his image um, where it says uh, Dr. Weiner and it'll go directly to him. It's been pinned right in the comment section so you can see it there. The, um, do not forget that we are on and you can go to birthmark.org backslash conferences to see the information. Um, I have our plan A and plan B all outlined. Uh, we do have the free lodging for anyone who can come. Now remember, if you're in quarantine, that's going to be a problem because <laughs> you'd have to stay in New York City for 14 days. Then quarantine when you get home. So as a matter of fact, Dr. Geronimus is, does not want people who are quarantined to, to come because it's, you know, it's hard on his, his staff as well. Um, oh, so Kennedy's cause is saying we hear from so many families how much you've changed their lives. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you very much, yeah, and uh, it's it's always good to be with Linda in uh, New York, and it's always good to see all my old friends on the internet, people who I haven't seen for many, many years. Reminds me of how old I'm really getting. Yeah, all right, can we not talk <laughs> about that stuff? And by the way, isn't it nice to be doing Facebook Live actually live? Oh, yeah. Let's yeah. have a hallelujah for that, because it's <laughs> been 10 months. I've been doing the split screens, and we'll, we'll continue to do some of those, but any opportunity we can, we're going to be doing them um, live. Last question from Doris Ortiz. Is there a dermatologist in Orlando? I need laser treatment. So we have Dr. Duarte, who is in Miami. Um, you can, there may be a dermatologist in Orlando. I seem to remember, sure is, yeah. I, I seem to remember one. Um, if you email me at birthmark.org, well, I mean, if you email me at bbfpresident at gmail.com, I will look and see if I can find out who that is for you, Doris, okay? So thank you all. It's been great to uh, hear from you all, and I'm sure that you all will, some of you can watch this back and, you know, see Dr. Wainer's answers to questions if you've missed any. Um, and as always, stay safe. We will be posting in a few weeks what our, our live section will be for session will be for November. Um, it's undecided right now because we have a lot of requests for Sturz Weber, but we may be doing um, another Port Weinstein session. So thank you all for tuning in and oh won't we oh Jim, <laughs> he's saying thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Weiner, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Take care. Stay See safe you. and stay well. Okay.